from Washington. I'm Karen Donfried with GMF, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this book talk with Professor John Eikenberry. Professor Eikenberry is the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. He is also a longstanding friend of GMF and of mine, and I couldn't be happier than to be helping launch his terrific new book, A World Safe for Democracy, Liberal Internationalism, and the Crisis of the Global Order. And I wanna start by encouraging all of you to buy this book. I know this is a crowd that loves books, and if you buy it, you get to write in the margins as John prompts you to think deep thoughts reading what is really a fascinating history of the past two centuries of liberal internationalism. And knowing this crowd, I know you also have friends who like to read and the holidays are coming. So you really should buy multiple copies and your family members and friends will be grateful to you for that. So John, of course, the first question that everybody has is what is liberal internationalism? And you boil it down really nicely in the book. And I'm gonna quote one piece where you say, the essential element and guiding impulse of this tradition of liberal internationalism is the cooperative organization and reform of international order so as to protect and facilitate the security, welfare, and progress of liberal democracy. In short, to make the world safe for democracy. So with that definition, John, share with us the key argument you make in the book. First of all, thanks, Karen. It's great to be with you uh, uh, and to have this opportunity to talk about the book. Uh, uh, the book really began as a set of lectures at the University of Virginia, where I was asked to reflect on liberal internationalism uh, in the context of kind of the, the crisis of the moment, which I'm sure we will get to. And uh, that really led me to ask the, the broader question, well, what is liberal internationalism? Uh, I'm not sure if my host thought I was going to write uh, an obituary for liberal internationalism, but I needed to figure out what precisely was, was either transforming or dying or, or, or evolving in one way or another. So uh, I went back and, 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 and really uh, looked at the, the long durée, the, the rise of liberal internationalism as a way of thinking about and acting in the world. Um, and the book tries to really do three things before I just narrowly define your, your or answer your question. It, it tries to, um, persuade you that there is a tradition, that there is a kind of liberal international tradition that re reaches back to the very early period of, of liberal democracy, the age of democratic revolutions, the, the enlightenment era, uh, and that there is a kind of gravitas and kind of a, a strength and resiliency to this, set, this line of ideas and projects that have gone through the 19th and 20th century. Secondly, I, I try to, um, grapple with the failures and successes that, that there has been, I think, a, a crisis today, partly because we, we, we don't see liberal internationalism performing very well. We, we associate it with the financial crisis of 2008, uh, perhaps even the Iraq war, a kind of dysfunction of liberal democracy entangles liberal internationalism and that project into its failure. So how do we think about, how do we rescue and reconstruct uh, the project and then thirdly, try to look to the future to, to, to see where a kind of uh, reimagined, reinvigorated liberal internationalism might, might be part of the big debate about the next world order uh, in the 21st century. Um, and so in that sense, the question is where can we plant the flag of liberal internationalism? So just to finish up, a liberal internationalism, I think is it's, it's come in many different guises. It's been uh, a kind of laissez-faire, capitalist democracy, it's been social democracy, it's been entangled with, with uh, empire uh, uh, during the Anglo era of the 19th century. It's been uh, very much tied, uh, I think quite successfully to American power in the 20th century. So it's, it's been a fellow traveler with 
uh, the project of building uh, 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 the kind of uh, Pax Americana that uh, we now see uh, uh, troubled today. Um, so the center, I think, of liberal internationalism, as I argue in this book, is, is not as sometimes it is seen as a kind of uh, program to transform the world and spread democracy to distant shores, but it's really a, a set of ideas and projects for making the world safe for democracy, for creating a kind of ecosystem or environment in which liberal democracies, which are always sort of like orchids, very, very precious, very fragile in a certain sense, and need a kind of structure for them to be uh, safe and secure, that that kind of international project is tied to making liberal democracies safe and better. And, and for me, that's the, the, that's the ground on which uh, we need to defend and reimagine liberal internationalism. So John, I do want to dig deeper into those themes that you just articulated. I also want to say to everyone listening that I do plan to weave your questions into the conversation. So do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and just send those questions in and look forward to hearing from all of you. John, you mentioned that this grand project of liberal internationalism is in crisis today. And one of the themes that comes through so strongly in the book is that that crisis, and you say it's most profoundly manifest in a lost confidence in collective solutions to common problems. And then you write, surprisingly, the retreat from liberal internationalism is coming from the very states that had been the post-war orders patrons and stakeholders, the two great powers that have done the most to give the modern international order a liberal character, Great Britain and the US, the world's oldest and most venerated democracies now seem to be pulling back from this leadership. And, I, and you just mentioned this and I wanna draw you out on it. How central has Anglo-American global dominance, dominance been to liberal internationalism? And what does that mean for the future if those countries are pulling back? Yeah, I think the answer, the short answer is very important. I think that uh, the, the Anglo-American era has been uh, important uh, to uh, harnessing and promoting a kind of open rule-based approach to international order. Uh, and it, so the, the failure of the, the, the problems within the liberal democratic world today uh, feed directly into the, the kind of the un, unraveling, if you will, of this, this kind of collective uh, imagination that we can work together to solve our, our common problems across the liberal democratic world and across the larger world. We forget sometimes that the a critical moment that I talk about in the book when the kind of fusing of, of economic security uh, it, it, during the Roosevelt era, uh, during the late 30s and during World War II, the, the fireside chats, the notion that what we as democratic states uh, have at the center of our agenda is making our, our collective lives safe. Uh, uh, the, the term security was used over and over by FDR. That was a term that wasn't used in the in the time of, of, of Woodrow Wilson in the 19th century. There was a real sense that, that uh, to be inside of a liberal democratic world, uh, what R Roosevelt called the United Nations, uh, was to be inside of a kind of club where we were collectively working to make each other better and safer uh, and more prosperous. And that got unraveled, I think, uh, during the, 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 ironically, at the very moment when uh, the uh, uh, the liberal democracies were celebrating their victories in the Cold War. The, the, in some sense, the, the, the notion of being a, a security community, being a club of, of democracies, where to be inside was to have benefits, to be inside of a trade system, to be inside of a, a multilateral order where you had mechanisms, a, what Roosevelt called a toolkit to solve problems. Uh, that in the kind of spreading out of that system, the, the club character uh, 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 eroded. And I, I make this little argument at the end of the book that in some sense, what we've gone from, we've gone from a kind of club to, to the liberal order as a kind of shopping mall where countries can 
walk in and walk out and go to one place. They can sign up for something, but not another thing. So this, this notion of conditionality, for example, that notion which is so much so important for the European Union's project that to be in is to have benefits, but also to sign up to a suite of obligations and responsibilities, that that, that has been lost. And so, uh, and then finally, this notion of, of that order, that club having some, uh, some implications for the way everyday people live their everyday lives, that we've lost that sense that a liberal international order is good for me as a working person, as opposed to the, the you might call it the post-2008 view that it's kind of all neoliberalism and it's about a platform for capitalists and bankers to do deals. So the kind of loss of that broader, more comprehensive notion that we're in it together, that we our societies are better off uh, working in, in common cause. Uh, and, and so we need to, to, to remember that. And, and when the, the next order building moment arrives, and it will arrive at some point, we, maybe we aren't at rock bottom, but we will be very soon, I hope, uh, rethinking and working in new ways together that we should remember some of these uh, insights from the past. Uh, in some sense, the book is trying to provide a, a usable past, a kind of, a kind of remember uh, both the accomplishments and failures so that when we do it again, as we always will be in some sense doing it again, we, we can have uh, the best guidance uh, uh, from our ideas and history to, to move forward. John, I wanna stay on the role of the US for a minute. And actually we already have uh, one of the questions focused on the relationship between liberal internationalism and US hegemony. And you talk, you just mentioned right now, and this comes through clearly in the book, this idea that the Cold War ended suddenly and unexpectedly. And poof, the great geopolitical struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union ends. And you write, what followed in the 1990s was the closest the world has come to a liberal moment. You just mentioned this. Um, so with the Cold War over, the United States invites the world into its Western liberal order. And you talked just now about club membership and maybe people didn't live up to the obligations that they should have done. So is it that when the US invited the world in, we didn't insist on the new members meeting the obligations or was the US wrong to invite the world in? Was it an example of overreach? How, how do you think about that? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I wrestle with that. I, I don't have a, you know, a kind of bottom line really. I, on balance, I think it was right to, to, to expand uh, uh, even though it didn't turn out the way many of us thought it would, uh, particularly with China, the, the, the WTO. I think we will be debating this for a few years and I will wade into it in the next few years about, uh, about kind of what might have gone wrong, but, but some things went right. And, and the other thing that I think we need to, when thinking, when thinking about liberal internationalism and, and the liberal order, uh, it's always kind of been a story. The narrative from 1776 or 1789 has been of kind of unfolding, a kind of a, a building a more perfect union, uh, a, a inclusion and integration, uh, whether it's in the American experience, uh, the story of America is a story of more and more people uh, becoming citizens, becoming get, gaining rights, uh, women, the uh, suffrage, uh, uh, blacks uh, 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 being recognized as humans and citizens, uh, voting rights. So the kind of expansion of of the project has always been at the heart of individual democracies and the, the community of democracies that in various moments have seen themselves more or less as kind of a community. And so when the, the, the last alternative to liberal internationalism falls away at the end of the Cold War, it, it almost seemed uh, uh, obvious uh, that, uh, that there were people wanting to join uh, the, the liberal project was not just about Europe and the United States. It was about Mandela and South Africa. It was about Eastern European states, Havel, 
uh, Gandhi, you know, the kind of the freedom movements, the liberation. There, it was the body of ideas that that were uh, most tied to uh, to uh, to liberation, to post-imperial uh, ordering of the world. So uh, it was. I don't think you could have stood up if you were George Herbert Walker Bush or or, or Clinton. Uh, you could have stood up and said, "We." Uh, there's a boundary here. <laughs> uh, you aren't allowed in. I, I, I think that would have been impossible. I think there could have been more efforts at, at, at kind of hard-nosed conditionality in particular regimes. Um, but in some ways, um, the failure today is not so much that China hasn't been performing, which is maybe true in the way we wanted, but that we haven't been performing as well. And so there isn't that kind of coherent uh, deeply coherent and uh, integrated, governed kind of uh, space that we want China to join. So in some sense, we don't have our ducks in a row to truly uh, do the kind of expansion of the order that that we might want to do. So um, so that's how I would I would start to answer your question. And John, that you also have an interesting discussion in the book about the relationship between liberal internationalism and liberal interventionism. And in there, you also talk about the Iraq war. And I want to draw you out on this because near the end of that chapter, you write, the most telling critique of liberal internationalism is not its urge for empire or tendency to pursue coercive regime change. It is the opposite, that liberal internationalism is too often weak and easily co-opted by other agendas. And I want, I want you to explain that. Yeah, th that's one of the major moves in my book is to, um, to to, to argue that liberal internationalism is simultaneously, it's kind of a paradox, capacious and has vast horizons of global vision attached to it, but it's also very thin in a sense of, it's not a, a movement that has ever on its own galvanized the world. It's, as I say, it's a, it's a kind of army, it's a flag without an army. It's always needed coalition partners. It's always worked as a kind of not a parasite, that sounds too poor, pejorative, but as a kind of, it needs a host, it work, it needs to attach to others. And it has attached to Anglo-American hegemony, as we were saying earlier, even though it's not inherently simply a story of Britain and the United States in the two centuries. But it has t entangled itself in the 19th century and early 20th century with empire, certainly with great power politics. It was tied to the Cold War uh, and it, for some cold warriors, liberal internationalism was a, a useful cover for a kind of uh, uh, a means to an, to an end. And for other, for other liberals, it was an end and the Cold War was the, the means. So, so it was always kind of in this complex relationship. Great power wars and, and military interventions did not begin with liberal internationalism and did not begin with liberal democracies as our realist friends tell us uh, states have been uh, imperializing and intervening and balancing and warring with each other since the since states emerged uh, uh, across, across the classical and modern era. So in some sense, liberal internationalism is entangled during the American era with wars um, uh, in one way or another. But but in some sense, what I've tried to suggest is that it's it, it, it it's not in itself, a kind of, its DNA is not, uh, uh, it does not take you to, to those wars. It's, it's, it's like the debate about liberalism and empire. Is it inherent as some uh, cr critical theorists would say, is it, just, is it just empire all the way down or is it more of a contingent relationship? I try to make the contingent argument both for liberalism's con connections to empire and to military interventionism. So the Iraq war, the architects were not liberal internationalists, uh, maybe maybe uh, Wolfowitz, but but the Cheney and Rumsfeld. Th this was a, a hegemonic project that 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 is very uh, recognizable uh, for 
historians of power politics across the centuries. So there, there's nothing specifically liberal about the impulse there. Uh, uh, it played a role in one way or another. I, uh, in some papers I've written with uh, Dan Dudney at Johns Hopkins, we've, we've explored this in some depth uh, to, to engage the, the position that's out there that, uh, that liberal internationalism uh, is in some sense uniquely um, expansionary and interventionist. And, and, and we resist, and, and in this book, I resist that, that claim by trying to analytically separate it from these other great forces that liberal inter internationalism is both pushing off against and using in coalition to advance its own interests and, and agendas. So it's interesting because this ties into a point you made earlier about how it has been a challenge for supporters of liberal internationalism to convince the American public that liberal internationalism is good for them as working people and that sort of we're all in this together. And it connects to a question that one of our, our listeners has sent in. She's asking, you know, let's for a moment assume a post-Trump era. And she said, I hear two different narratives emerging when people think about a post-Trump era. One says Trumpism is so strong and has such deep roots that go, that precede Trump, that not much is going to change. That in a sense that the Trump ideology captures the view of most Americans. And then she says, the other argument is, it seems to sort of try to leap over Trumpism and say, no, no, if we think, for example, about the US relationship to Europe, will return to an expanded and stronger transatlantic partnership. And she's curious how you think about this, sort of the domestic support for liberal internationalism and what that means. Yes, that's, that's a great question. And I, I've been thinking a lot about that. I, and I'm really, my narrative is that, uh, that, uh, that there is more liberal internationalism to come, that there is another cycle, if you will, of American leadership those are slightly different arguments, but they come together. I do think that, that uh, starting with, with, with Trump, that, that he's not an aberration in the sense that there has always been in America a kind of illiberalism, uh, starting with uh, you know, the founding. I mean, uh, the, the most illiberal part of, of, the, of America at the founding was, was, was what John Adams called the slaveocracy, the, 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 what, and then the Confederacy, the Civil War. There's always been a kind of illiberal uh, kind of nationalism, a pugnacious resistance to engaging with others, a resistance to immigration, and this kind of America as this melting pot. There's, there's always been that kind of, and it will always be there. And when, when Trump leaves office, it, it might be put back into the closet, but it's not going to go away. Uh, it was there with, uh, with in, in, you know, MacArthur and uh, Lindbergh. There's a long tradition of what you might call alt America, which has always been the other part, uh, the, the the other the other bipolar part of, of the liberal uh, story of America. Uh, uh, but I would say, what specifically thinking about Trump, um, it looks to me like an absolute failure, and that 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 it will be coded by a majority of people as something that, well. We tried that. Wow, that didn't work. Uh, a kind of backlash to the backlash, uh, a, a sense that this has not made us stronger. It's not made us. It's not made working people uh, better off. Uh, there are fewer industrial jobs today than when Trump took office. So on his own terms, he hasn't succeeded, and in the process, he has undermined 75 years of investment in a world that has brilliantly, if accidentally, uh, benefited both the US and the world. It's just been, it's kind of jaw dropping to, to see us as a country that has benefited so much from its internationalism to uh, in this four year period to basically say, well, enough is enough, or uh, uh, that's not us. Uh, so I think that there's an opportunity when, uh, you know, kind of the dialectics of history give us a kind of moment where, where the the alternative position will now be able to be put out there, and that alternative 
position may be in the form of Biden foreign policy. It will certainly intellectually and politically, it will be debates about uh, about a, a different uh, a different uh, grand strategy from uh, 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 from uh, uh, fr kind of an America first uh, uh, grand strategy of Trump. So so in that in that moment, partly this is why I wanted to write this book is to 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 try to argue that there is an alternative and that it's it's not just um, something that was dreamt up after 1989 or even after 1945, but there's this longer tradition uh, which has that which has a kind of uh, intellectual and, and political gravitas that that is out there that that liberal democracies uh, have a certain kind of affinity for and it, they can be brought it can be brought back into play uh, in the next cycle of history when we uh, debate what 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 comes next when we debate what kind of order we want to build on the rubble of whatever it is that we are now uh, uh, we, uh, uh, breaking apart. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where I, I would go. I, I, um, there there seems to me to be a a kind of hunger for 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 reconstructing our relationships with. Uh, uh, countries in the world, there seems to be a hunger on the other side for some kind of reconnection, uh, whether it's uh, in East Asia or Europe. Uh, uh, there's not a, a clamoring towards some alternative set of ideas for organizing the world. There's a lot of energy uh, uh, for multilateralism in, in middle, uh, middle level states, middle powers, uh, Australia, South Korea, uh, uh, Canada, there's a there's a coalition, a, a an alliance for multilateralism that uh, I heard the South Korean foreign minister talk about. I think it was it was promoted by the French and the Germans last uh, in spring of uh, 2019. It has 50 countries uh, with foreign ministers who sign on. There's a there's a kind of energy there. I think uh, particularly in the non-hegemonic states and the middle states that that live and die by multilateralism. Uh, uh, and so, and I think finally, I think probably a little bit of the uh, the, the kind of the, the the destruction of American hubris probably helps as well. That I don't think we should give up on the idea of American exceptionalism. I think a certain kind of exceptionalism, as others, uh, Jake uh, Sullivan and others have have very eloquently argued, a, a certain sense of of American identity as special, as, as uniquely positioned to do things in the world is good. If that's exceptionalism, we don't wanna lose that, but we can lose a certain exceptionalism as we know everything, that we've got the secrets, that our model is, is, is good for everybody. So a kind of humility can be tied to a, to a return to, to engagement. Um, and, and I think all those things will, will, will set us up for a kind of creative period uh, uh, of diplomacy and, and order building. The, the one final thing I'll say, Karen, is, and this is a theme that runs through the book, and I hadn't really, when I started the book, hadn't really seen this as one of the key takeaways, but it is, and that is that at every moment across the, the last 200 years where internationalism of this sort, of we'll call it liberal internationalism, internationalism tied to, to uh, making the world safe for democracy has been connected to domestic movements, progressive movements for, for developing capacities inside of our countries to, to, uh, to build safety nets and to, to integrate uh, peoples and to, 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 uh, to advance the prospects of, of uh, everyday people inside of these countries. And so my takeaway is that we can't really have another golden era internationally with a kind of golden, without a golden era domestically. I, I, we, we can't uh, have an internationalism and simultaneously uh, perpetuate the kind of inequalities uh, uh, and uh, 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 social dysfunctions that uh, make it very difficult for, for a kind of centrist, uh, coalition tied to growth and social advancement to to drive our foreign policy. So so we've got to simultaneously 
do things at home if we want to do things abroad. Mm -hmm. John, a couple of our listeners are picking up on the, the theme you mentioned about alliance of multilateralists, and they're actually questioning the appetite of other countries to continue to participate in an American-led order. So one of the questions is formulated as, was the invitation into the Anglo-American club seen as suspect by other countries? And they really see it as a way of extending United States dominance. And then the, the, the question that goes in a similar vein asks, wouldn't you say that the failure of liberal internationalism led by the US is mainly due to the imposition of an American model of democracy in the global South and the underdeveloped world? Isn't it a crisis of credibility or legitimacy? How would you respond to that? I think it is partly a crisis of credibility and legitimacy. And I think there's a lot of work to do. Um, let me just start by, by saying what the appetite for, for alliances and connections. I, I think I, I, what I try to do in the end of the book is, is, is try to reimagine the coalition. It's, it's not the G7 anymore. I, there's this uh, no, narrative out there that yes, we can kind of rebuild a, a kind of an American foreign policy, but we can't go back to the past. I, I think that's probably true, but we can draw on the past and the kind of I, the principles and ideas and bargains, but with a, a, a broader and, and more diverse coalition of states uh, in East Asia, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I travel a lot. I talk a lot with, uh, with in, in Europe and East Asia and to friends. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, a disillusionment with the United States. There's, a, there's going to be a mistrust of America that the Trump years, and, and going back before the Trump years, of course, as well, uh, it puts, it, it put, it puts a, a kind of question mark to, uh, on America's next uh, tranche of promises that it will it will uh, act in a certain way there, there's there's a credibility problem but I think I think um, there's there's um, it, it's it partly uh, comes down to how the US steps out again uh, if it is uh, we are going to reimpose American hegemony and you're either with us or against us. That's not going to work. But if it's a if it's a more uh, coalitional approach, which the United States probably is not as good at as 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 it is when it's first among equals, but but a, a sense that we're in it together, that we we aren't going to be able to 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 uh, protect the rules and institutions of the international system that 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 will allow those rules and institutions to privilege values we care about openness, freedom of information, transparency, accountable government, the role of civil society. Those are values that are, are, are being contested today. And what, we are not gonna be able to protect them unless we, we protect them together. Um, so, so, so I would say there is a latent constituency for a rebuilding of a coalition that where the U.S. plays a slightly different role, uh, but still plays an important catalytic role. Um, for the global South, uh, there's much to in the 20th century to regret about America's foreign policy. There's no question about it. Uh, I tried to speak a little bit to the to the to military interventionism, uh, but I would say to to countries in the global south that, uh, yes, the US has not always acted in ways that benefit you, but the overall system, what kind of system do you want uh, for the future? At the very least, you want a, a, a global order that is that has rules and open multilateral mechanisms for cooperation. Uh, you don't want to live in a, a neo-imperial world where uh, the great powers reimpose spheres of influence. Uh, the U.S. has been on the right side of history in the 20th century in that regard. It has uh, uh, imperfectly, to be sure, um, 
uh, uh, seen its project as an alternative to European empire, even British empire. And you can talk to, well, you can't, but if you could, you could talk to Churchill about that because Roosevelt was, was very much uh, uh, looking to find uh, opportunities to push off against that older uh, 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 hierarchical uh, imperial way of order, ordering the world. The US both saw a post-imperial world as in its interest, uh, as we've uh, the, my book uh, tries to show, looking at debates during World War II about how much openness uh, do, do you want, but also uh, a, a kind of, a kind of a moral vision that the US um, is part of that, that developing countries that want to uh, integrate and develop rule of law, uh, uh, societies want to fight corruption, uh, uh, want to resist state-to-state uh, -state dealings where you are at the mercy of autocratic and kleptocratic elites. Uh, if that's part of the, your escape from uh, despotism and repression, uh, positioned as you are in the global South, you want more liberal internationalism. You want America to live up to its ideals rather than, because it hasn't fully lived up to its ideals, look for some alternative model. As I said, I don't think the US as a domestic model is necessarily something that, uh, that should be exported and other countries should import. Uh, uh, research, uh, survey research, global uh, statistical studies of where the kind of center of gravity is in, in countries large and small, West and non-West, is a kind of social democratic model. It may be more Scandinavian than American, uh, but it is, a, it is a vision of capitalism, democracy, and liberalism, which is important because it, it's not just populist, we the people, which is important, it's also rule of law. And for people around the world, uh, that kind of rule of law uh, world system is, is where, the, where a, a brighter future lies for all of us. So you've got to, you've got to uh, root for the countries that have put that into their grand strategy. So I think you may have just answered another question that came in, but this one was about China. And I wanna shift the, the focus of our conversation to China because it's such an important part of the story. And the, the question was, uh, Xi was quoted as asking, if democracy brings Trump and Brexit, what's so good about it? And I think you just made the case for why as an international order, this is compelling to people, but just keep that in the back of your head. I wanna play off part of the discussion you had in the book about China. And you refer to the Clinton administration's decision to invite China to join the World Trade Organization as the capstone of this liberal internationalist strategy. And you say there was a hegemonic bargain there. You know, the United States was gonna let China into the order, but China had some responsibilities as well. And China dropped the ball. China didn't put in place the liberal reforms that were expected of it. So how does this play out? If, you know, in a sense you're saying, okay, the fox is in the headhouse, but what do we do now? Um, you have this rising power, you have this very powerful country in China that doesn't share this view of liberal internationalism. Um, and, and we have a couple of questions about the alternative that China's proposing. And what will that future look like? So I'd love to draw you into that. Yeah, that's I, I I don't write it as much as I should have about China in my book. And I actually was writing a book about China and liberal order mm -hmm. before I put that down to, to work to write this this book. And I, I, I hope to return to that question. Um, I, I, as I, I think I do it, argue in the in, in the book there was a what you might call a liberal bet in the 1990s uh, but it really runs from uh, Bush to Clinton to Bush to Obama that that um, the, the US and the world was better off by inviting China 
into the order and and making kind of bets about uh, its own domestic uh, transformation. It wasn't simply that we'll let them join the WTO and then they will become a democracy like us. It was more of a capitalism in China will uh, create more space in their in their society for voices and pluralism that eventually can bubble up dom uh, domestically into a, a, a government reform. That didn't happen. I don't think we anticipated Xi. Or, uh, we, we probably should have recognized that China was just too big. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it was a historian long ago who said China is, is is too big to be digested by the West, but not big enough to impose an alternative on the West. And in some ways, we're kind of stuck in that, that middle position. Um, I guess uh, what, 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 there are several things in today what, where, where I think we are, because you're kind of asking, what do we do today? I mean, we, we do need to kind of think back and whether you're a liberal internationalist like me or a realist, uh, you, you, you and others, you kind of want to look back and, and, and try to sort through the evidence and the stories that, that uh, we have of this post-Cold War period to see what we did right, what we did wrong, what could have been different. There are counterfactuals there. Should we have, 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 have constructed a containment order to keep China out? I think that was just not realistic. Uh, should we have had more conditionality attached to particular uh, uh, invitations for regime participation. Yes, there should have been more conditionality. Uh, should the U.S. and its partners have tried to refashion and refurbish the liberal order so it was a more formidable counterweight to China? And and that third should have should have would have could have is where I would put the most uh, emphasis now. That that with China partly in and partly out of the order, the best step is, I, I sort of call it a kind of two level game, but the one level is to, as we were talking at the very beginning, to re rebuild a kind of coalition of, of liberal democracies who want to uh, protect uh, a set of values and a way of life that has not been uh, challenged really for for half a century, uh, the Cold War, yes, but never fully. It was always um, kind of a contest with an alternative. But now, with China, there really is a kind of alternative model, a kind of even a grander. You can make it in a. You could put this, this in grander terms of a kind of what Habermas, uh, Jurgen Habermas, calls modernity projects. There's been a, a a liberal democratic modernity project, but now we have a kind of China. Uh, Chinese modernity project under Xi to build a world with capitalism without democracy and capitalism without liberalism. It's a, it is an alternative, and and that you know, let's let the contest begin. Let's let's see how it, how these two models uh, uh, grapple with problems that uh, are new: uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, pandemics, uh, and it, it's not clear that the liberal democratic model will always win, but the contest itself is a, can be a constructive one to, to, uh, to drive our society and societies that we affiliate with to, to do better and to, 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 to raise the game and to reimagine uh, a, a global space where liberal democracies are at the center of it. Uh, where they, they continue to have a kind of critical mass. Uh, uh, they are 70 or more percent of world GNP now. Um, uh, uh, Europe and the United States have, are underperforming cooperatively on how to, to create a, a constructive other for China to confront. It doesn't have to be a Cold War, but a kind of um, gravitas of geopolitical weight that can uh, provide a, a basis to, uh, to, to build a constructive relationship with China when we are both, where we will be both cooperating and competing. And so, so I, I think that that's the two level game to, to build out and strengthen the 
the liberal democratic world, but also to, to make sure that there is this larger global uh, arena of diplomacy based not on liberal principles, but on, we'll call it Westphalian principles, sovereign equality, countries that our nation states are in. You're not in because of your regime type, you're in because you are making commitments and your respect and status is based on your ability to carry out those commitments. That's the Westphalian system. That's the system China and the United States are in together. That's the larger global framework that we're gonna to need to tackle together global warming, pandemics, uh, the, the, many of these global problems of the future have to be done together. But we're more likely to do it together on our terms if, if we, and the we I'm speaking of here, are this next generation cohort of liberal democracies, if that uh, next generation cohort is, is working together, uh, then you're more likely to have good results in your uh, engagement with China and, and you're gonna kind of be able to, to simultaneously uh, find ways to cooperate globally and pr protect what, what I've emphasized in this book as social purposes that not everybody in the world share, uh, social purposes that, that do uh, emerge from the, from the liberal democratic experience. And uh, you can't protect those social purposes simply in a Westphalian order where every country is in it for itself, that you need to have a kind of coalition. You need a critical mass of countries that share those social purposes, whether it's environmental standards, labor rights, social welfare provisions, uh, human rights uh, understandings. That bundle, that's not a global bundle of universal uh, values, but a global, but a bundle of liberal democratic values, and you, those are going to, those are going to, those are going to always be under pressure in a world where, uh, if 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 it's one country, one vote, we're all in it for ourselves. Uh, so that's that's what you want to avoid, and the starting point is to reimagine a kind of space where liberal democracies can, can affiliate. So this is interesting, John, you know, this vision of the next generation of liberal internationalism and the liberal democracies that are at the core of that. Um, you said earlier that the United States not, may not be presenting the domestic model for that. Maybe it's more of a Scandinavian model. And, you know, in the book, you're very clear that the best way to order the international space rests on a coherent set of ideas. And those, are ide those ideas are one, international openness, meaning open trade, two, multilateralism and rules-based relations. And we see those embodied in many of the multilateral institutions that undergirded the order. Three, democratic solidarity and cooperative security, and four, progressive social purposes. And you just talked about that. And one of the listeners has written in, if liberal internationalism is connected to and based upon social advancement and the fight against domestic inequality, doesn't that make it a left liberal project, thus limiting its reach? And as part of the partisanship and polarization in the US or in the UK, an example of liberal internationalism being seen more as a project of the left than a project of Americans. What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I, I think that is a, I mean, I, I sadly agree with the, the point in some ways that we've come to a stage in our history where that does sound like uh, to helping working class people uh, uh, creating and re rebuilding the social safety net, reestablishing a social contract, 
that that somehow sounds partisan. I mean, it's it's sad but true that that's probably the way a lot of people look at it. Um, uh, but it's not the way it's always been. And I think one can imagine um, a future where where we've kind of we kind of get over that. Uh, uh, but but uh, the, there's been a, a remarkable post-war consensus from the center right and the center left, uh, from Truman to Eisenhower. Eisenhower was a very important figure in accepting and and seeing the virtues of the of the New Deal American system, so to speak, America's third founding. If you think of the American founding. Uh, the original founding uh, as number one, Lincoln's era as founding number two, uh, uh, the, the, the New Deal founding, when there was a kind of re-establishment of, of, a, of, a, of a, a kind of uh, understanding of how state markets and society are put together in the context of a much more dangerous and vulnerable world that we, we, we experienced in the 30s and 40s and during the Cold War. But it wasn't a left versus right story. It was it was a kind of center that involved both parties and ideologically um, uh, brought in the the broad center. Uh, and it wasn't simply you know in, in the other countries were going through this as well. Britain, <clears throat> you had Tories who were and are today champions of the of national health system. Uh, uh, Boris Johnson, a Tory conservative, as is in some sense to the left of most American Democrats, if you will, on the role of the welfare state, let's say. Uh, and Germany, post-war Germany from Earhart onward, uh, uh, you had a kind of conservative uh, vision uh, of the social market that <clears throat> was, that uh, squared a kind of, uh, again, a kind of uh, a post war German conservatism with, with a, an active state and a kind of social, um, uh, social and Christian democratic vision of society. And France, Japan, all these countries were rebuilding their industrial societies in an, an, in an industrial and post-industrial age. And that's not, you know, I, I think the, the underlying reality is not that a that, that you know, Teddy Roosevelt was a progressive as much as Woodrow Wilson. So, so again, my point is that it's not and hasn't been uh, simply everything to the left of the center. That's, that's the, those are the folks that are doing internationalism. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, on both sides. Uh, and it is a kind of malady that we have to overcome that, that it's now seen in some quarters that to be you know a conservative or to be a a true republican you have to resist everything th that was done over the last 75 years that that's that's i don't think we need to we want to adjust to that fact we want to find a way to minimize the presence of that fact Interesting. So we're, we're, time is racing and we have an amazing set of questions still that I could ask you. Let me ask you one final question from, from the folks who have um, sent them in. There have been a couple questions about the relationship between liberal internationalism and multilateralism. And obviously you make the case that multilateralism is one of the key ideas that helps order that liberal international space. Um, and the specific, one of the specific questions is, what are the most appropriate international institutions to coordinate those liberal democratic states in this liberal order? Are the existing institutions like the UN system, NATO, the WTO, are those still appropriate? And is it simply about reforming them or do we need to think anew about the multilateral institutions that undergird that order? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the first part of it, multilateralism, is, is not uniquely liberal. Uh, you know, there can be rules and understandings between actors that are, don't have a liberal character. Uh, the, 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 
you know, the mob, you know, uh, organized crime, there are rule, it's rule based in many ways, but it's not liberal. So, and you can imagine a rule based autocratic world in some sense, but multilateralism is something that is uniquely tied to the liberal democratic experience. Uh, it was John Rawls, but made the argument, although it goes all the way back to Locke, that that countries that are the, that enshrine in their own constitutions the rule of law are more likely to want to and more capable of operating in a world that is that is also organized around the rule of law, which of course we mean multilateralism, where it's not the the amount of power you have, it's the principled. Uh, normative environment that you all as actors enter into at some level and check some of your power at least at the door, multilateralism. Um, what, I guess I would say we need a kind of mix of old and new. Um, I, I, I propose not in the book but in an article in Foreign Affairs this past summer, a, a kind of my own version of a D10, D standing for democracy. Um, uh, uh, and I think there are probably other networked informal uh, arrangements. I talked about the alliance of uh, multilateralism. Uh, these informal guidance groups, I think are gonna be more important. Anne-Marie Slaughter, my colleague and co-author has talked a lot about networks. Uh, I'm still pretty much a formal institution guy. I still think they're important. I definitely think the alliances are very important. I've always argued uh, in, a, in a series of books that these alliances, starting with NATO, are not just about security, they're about community and about frameworks for uh, weaving together our, our common common fates more generally and doing business and speaking, speaking truth to power and creating voice opportunities. So I, I'm a, a big believer in, in keeping institutions, reforming them, bringing new memberships in, changing the voting rules. Uh, I would love to see pulling back to the Westphalian order, I would love to see us make one more run at, at a reform of the UN Security Council, um, bringing India and Japan in, uh, uh, the voting, uh, the veto right could be changed. There, the last time we did that was 2005, the, the high level panel report. So we can, I think there are reforms of old institutions, new institutions, some more informal. I think there's a real mix. So unfortunately we need to close the session, but I wanna ask you one last question. So after you've wrestled with this topic and written this compelling book, at the end you write, um, you know, that you, you have some confidence that liberal internationalism's days are not yet over, I think is the way you put it. Would you go farther than that and you'd say that you're confident about the future of the order or just did you end the book feeling more optimistic about the future or more worried? Well, in some ways it, it kind of depends on which day I wake up and what's going on, but, uh, and you must feel the same way, Karen. Uh, some days you see the light, others you don't. Uh, I guess uh, I, 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 I try to, you know, I'm, sort of just by constitution, a kind of optimist. And I, I do think the book argues that there's still more life in, in liberal internationalism and in the liberal democracies. Um, if we kind of go back to basics and back to the kind of core uh, project of, of securing uh, values and institutions we care dearly about, uh, we haven't had to think about those values and institutions uh, so much in our in my lifetime, in your lifetime, until today, until really the mo moments we can kind of feel what it must must have been like in the 30s and 40s, where there really truly was an extinction moment. International order is a kind of uh, playing field where lots of states are, and actors are trying to do different things, create a balance of power, uh, uh, do do uh, build communities, uh, secure rights, manage interdependence. Um, I guess what I would say is that. If the 21st century is going to be a, a world that uh, is defined by growing and even cascading uh, uh, forces of growing of, of economic and security interdependence, if if it's going to be a more intertwined world where every that much like the end, the pandemic is showing us that what goes on in other parts of the world can travel very easily to our part of the world 
that if that's the reality of the 21st century, uh, you will need more liberal internationalism, not left, less, because it's the only project and ideology for organizing the world that has a kind of moral and world-weary, tested um, agenda for or a cooperative organization of, the, of, of these common problems. There just isn't a, another great vision out there. Realism doesn't pro provide it. Marxism, post-colonialism, uh, Shiism doesn't. So it's, it's kind of by default, we've got this, this basket of ideas and projects and, and historical experience. Uh, and if that's the reality, a, a world of ever more complicated uh, interdependence, we're going to need some version of liberal internationalism. Well, <laughs> that is a great note to end on. I am going to declare success because one of the entries in the Q&A is someone telling me that they just bought your book while you were talking. So clearly on that front, you're doing well. But John, thank you so much for taking the time to share with this audience the important arguments you make in this book. I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation with you. And I do hope that this, like your past books, becomes a bestseller. So thanks so much. Thank you, and Karen. Thank you, thank you to everyone. the audience. Yes. Thank you, Karen. It's great to see you and, and uh, be safe, everyone. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye.